Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 20th annual Celebrate Invention at the University of Michigan. I'm Kelly Sexton, Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships. This afternoon, we will be presenting Henry King Ransom Professor of Law, J.J. Prescott, with the 2020 Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award, and discussing how his legal tech startup, Court Innovations, is making our courts more just and more accessible. Before we begin, I need to run through a couple of housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. As a registered participant, you'll be receiving a link to the recording after the fact. Second, if you submitted questions during the registration process, thank you. If you did not and have a question you would like to pose, please do so in the Q&A feature through Zoom. The question and answers feature will be monitored by our staff and questions will be forwarded to our moderator as time allows. Finally, I'd like to remind you that in this webinar, attendees cannot see each other. Attendees can only see the panelists. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce University of Michigan Law School Dean Mark West. Mark West is the Nippon Life Professor of Law and the 17th Dean of the University of Michigan Law School. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today to celebrate entrepreneurship and invention at the University of Michigan and to honor my friend and colleague, JJ Prescott. I'm especially pleased to be here because I get the sense that the story buildings and hallowed halls of the Law Quad, while picturesque and grand, might not always scream hotbed of innovation when compared to some other units. But in fact, we lawyers and the law can be quite progressive, especially when technology or changes are necessary to better serve our clients or improve access to justice. JJ's contributions to the law in this regard are unparalleled, and we are proud that he is the first University of Michigan faculty member outside of the College of Engineering and the Medical School to receive the university's Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award. JJ brings to his work an impressive mixture of the study of economics and law, as well as the experience of working in the courts. He served as a clerk to the Honorable Merrick Garland on the U.S. Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia Circuit following law school. He also is driven by the belief that courts have extraordinary potential to influence people's lives for the better. In 2014, JJ spearheaded the development of what we believe was the first of its kind technology to help people facing warrants, fines, and minor charges resolve their disputes with the government and courts online without the need to hire an attorney. The technology, known then as the UM Online Court Project, was part of the Global Challenges arm of UM's Third Century Initiative and was piloted at the District Court here in Washtenaw County. The Online Court Project went on to become the basis for Matterhorn, a free platform made available by courts that allows vulnerable litigants of all sorts to resolve their legal cases entirely online. Today, citizens can use Matterhorn as an alternative to in-person hearings in family courts, small claims courts, and in general jurisdiction courts, such as resolving landlord-tenant disputes. Matterhorn has facilitated the resolution of more than 100,000 cases in more than 100 courts across 16 states. The innovation has been even more important as we navigate COVID-19. But I should probably leave the rest of that story for JJ to tell. So JJ, on behalf of the entire Michigan law community, Congratulations on this well-deserved honor for your tireless dedication and commitment to ensuring justice, access to justice for all. Thank you, Dean West. I would like to now introduce University of Michigan Vice President for Research, Rebecca Cunningham, who will present the 2020 Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award to JJ Prescott, after which we will hear from Professor Prescott and then transition into the panel discussion. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you to everyone who's joining us virtually this afternoon. Here at the University of Michigan, we take great pride in the fact that we're among the world's largest research universities based on our volume. But what's even more important is how our faculty use their collective expertise and passion for research to address critical challenges, develop new technologies, and strengthen the economy. It's an honor each year for our office to present the Distinguished University Innovator Award because it highlights faculty's commitment to serving the world through research and scholarship. I'm pleased to present law professor J.J. Prescott with this year's award because he truly embodies this commitment. Professor Prescott identified a long-standing problem in that barriers to seek justice are not evenly distributed in society, but are overwhelming for some. 
He then used his expertise to design and build technology that helps people facing warrants, fines, and minor charges to resolve their disputes with the government and courts online without the need to hire an attorney. That technology went on to become the basis for Matterhorn, a free platform made available by courts that allows vulnerable litigants of all sorts to resolve their legal cases entirely online. We often talk about the importance of translating academic research to the marketplace. Professor Prescott has done exactly that, as his technology has facilitated the resolution of more than 100,000 cases in more than 100 courts across 16 states. Because of your incredible work to target poverty in the courts through innovative research and technology, I am pleased to award you virtually with this year's Distinguished University Innovator Award. Please join me. Thank you. Um, let me get my slides running real quick. Thank you. I hope you can see my slides okay. I want to start by um, uh, saying that I'm uh, incredibly grateful uh, to have received this award. Thanks to Kelly Sexton, Mark West, Rebecca Cunningham for their kind words, and to Mark Maynard and all of the many people who have made this award and event possible. And uh, thanks to Luke Schaefer and the panel participants. I'm looking forward to our discussion at 2.45 or maybe a few minutes after that. Also, I wanna take this opportunity right out in front uh, to thank MJ Cartwright and the Matterhorn team. And most of all, my wife who has sacrificed much to allow me time in the sandbox to innovate. 10 years ago, I never would have anticipated sitting here. I'm a lawyer and an economist by training and the idea of building something wasn't really on my radar. That's why I think my story is an important one. Researchers and teachers from every field in this university are bursting with ideas capable of transforming our world by creating products, software, processes, you name it. Those ideas can form the basis of new companies and nonprofits, and they can change the world for the better. Turns out this is true even for a law professor. I'm here today because I played an important role in envisioning, designing, and implementing a piece of legal technology called Matterhorn. Matterhorn, at its core, is an online platform that allows different parties, for example, an individual with a traffic ticket, or a small claims dispute, or an outstanding minor warrant, along with the police, a prosecutor, or other parties, and a judge to communicate in a structured way to resolve and adjudicate or adjudicate an ongoing legal issue. And it endeavors to do this in a way that is fair, transparent, and satisfying. Indeed, Matterhorn has become a model today for online dispute resolution, or ODR in the US. Let me tell you a quick personal story to show you how Matterhorn, or really not having something like Matterhorn, can make a difference in a single person's life, or actually two people's lives. This is my daughter, Annalise. More than seven years ago, uh, today she is unbelievably in her first weeks of middle school, barely tolerating me. But at this moment in time, she is looking very concerned about me getting pulled over for allegedly committing a traffic violation. The officer was nice, and he said I was nice. It may matter that we were both white men in the suburbs, but let me put that to the side for now. While he cited me for something more serious, he told me that if I went to court and requested a preformal hearing, the prosecutor would drop the charge to impeding traffic, which would result in fewer points on my license. I said, well, why not just give me impeding now? Do I really have to go to court? He explained that it wasn't his role to make that call and that the prosecutor had to do it at the courthouse. Frustrating. Two months later, I drove to court and waited for four hours, had a 10 second conversation with the prosecutor, agreed to impeding traffic and paid my fine. It seemed and still seems crazy, 10 seconds when everything was on paper. There were hundreds of other people that day doing the same thing at just this one court. How many tens of thousands of people around the country were also stuck in a line? All losing a day's work? Fine for me, I'm privileged and I am on a salary so I can miss a day or even work while I'm waiting, but terrible for other people who have to take time off work or who find getting to court difficult or intimidating or dangerous. How could this be the best way? And how about those who, because of the same barriers, can't make it at all? Maybe because they can't miss work or find transportation, or maybe because they are, un they are afraid of running into immigration, or maybe because it's not healthy at times to operate a system that depends on large numbers of people queuing up for hours. By the time I had this memorable in-person court experience, however, the basic idea behind Matterhorn had already been bubbling in my mind. 
months before I had begun thinking hard, initially as a potential re focus for my research, about outstanding minor warrants in this country. These are not arrest warrants for serious crimes, but warrants courts routinely issue when people fail to pay a traffic ticket or accidentally miss a court date. Tens of millions of people have such warrants in our country, and they disproportionately affect the poor and disenfranchised, which unfortunately means that there are significant disparities in the burdens of these bench warrants by race. A fine that turns into a warrant most of the time because someone is unable to pay often leads to avoidance behavior. Once people have a warrant, they don't vote, they don't apply for government benefits, and they don't call the police when they are victimized. In effect, someone with an outstanding war minor warrant no longer has the protection of law. Indeed, the Supreme Court ruled recently that people who have such warrants do not have Fourth Amendment protections against certain police searches. Having an outstanding warrant may also increase a person's likelihood of having an encounter with the police. In fact, the U.S. Justice Department's investigation of Ferguson, Missouri's law enforcement practices following the police shooting of Michael Brown documented in a very public way the extreme burdens of civil infractions and especially minor warrants in the U.S., and in particular, their disparate impact on Black Americans and other disadvantaged groups. This was the crux of the problem I wanted to address. But I quickly realized that the existence of the problem itself was actually sort of surprising. After all, the US Supreme Court decided long ago that you can't jail someone if they don't have the ability to pay a fine. And lots of anecdotal evidence suggests that if someone can't pay a fine because they don't have the money, they can usually come into court and find a, uh, find a way to work out a payment plan or some other solution. So the question is, why wasn't this happening? The answer, because people must come into court. And for many Americans, courts are simply not easy to access. The difficulties of accessing courts in many, uh, come in many different flavors. They can be economic. Coming to court requires taking time off work, paying for transportation, arranging childcare. They can be physical. Courts have limited business hours and people with disabilities or, uh, or the elderly cannot stand in line or navigate the courthouse. They can also be psychological. Courts are intimidating and the law is confusing. Imagine taking a day off work from an hourly paid job, costing you perhaps as much as the ticket itself just to assert your rights. You then take a bus to a courthouse or borrow a car, wait for many hours to see a judge, and then you are expected to explain that you're flat broke in a courtroom filled with people you don't know. Law enforcement is present and the judge or court staff listening may not look like you or understand your circumstances. And what if the judge doesn't believe you? It can be plain scary. Not surprising, many millions just don't go. So the challenge became, how do we get people with legal issues like an outstanding fine in a room with a judge or a prosecutor? Or if it's a small claims issue with another party, or if it's an infraction or a misdemeanor with the police or prosecutor. From the get-go, the answer was a, straight one, a straightforward one for me, online platform technology. If people can go to court, or for that matter, any government agency online, possibly asynchronously, and do so with the right support to ensure a high quality, authentic experience, how much more accessible would justice be in our country? The key realization was that, like so many brick and mortar services of the past, for example, banks, courts are really just a bundle of services. Some of those activities, like criminal trials, most likely need to occur in person, but many others do not. And if it were possible to design an online environment that people could trust and understand, and that would empower judges freeing them to focus on more complex in-person cases, we could nudge the courts toward a different paradigm. Now back to reality. I'm a recently tenured professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, what should I do? Write a paper? Maybe a screenplay? But this problem actually seemed solvable, so I dove in. First, I began exploring the idea in, a more, in more depth with a brilliant former student, just one dimension of the Michigan difference, our amazing students. Next, together, we reached out to the Office of Technology Transfer to start asking dumb questions. We have an idea, what's next? From day one, Tech Transfer and so many of its people were incredibly supportive. After showing us the ropes, Tech Transfer staff and mentors recommended that we participate in the NSF i program, which turned us on to the kinds of customer discovery we really needed to develop a successful idea. Tech Transfer also supported us when we sought IP protection for our software and processes. And most critically, Tech Transfer introduced us to MJ Cartwright, who quickly joined us in our vision of transforming courts. MJ soon became and remains the CEO of our eventual startup, Court Innovations. By connecting me with MJ and other entrepreneurs, Tech Transfer made it possible for me to juggle my scholarship and teaching while getting a big idea off the ground in the real world. 
Before too long, we received seed funding to develop a pilot version of our online platform from the University of Michigan's Third Century program. And we started talking with district courts in Michigan and the state court administrative office, which has always been uh, supportive. We soon organized as a for-profit startup once it became clear that courts were simply not interested in committing to reimagining what they do simply because some professor or even a new grant funded nonprofit had a nice piece of software. Courts, like other customers, want a service, wants the service structure and reliability that comes with a credible business plan. Our pilot implementations, which focused on resolving traffic tickets and outstanding minor warrants were a success. And the rest is really history. Today, Matterhorn, the platform has handled more than 100,000 cases and it has contracts in more than 15 states. While we started helping people resolve minor infractions and outstanding warrants, it quickly became clear to us, to us and to the courts we were working with, that there was a lot of potential uh, to this basic idea of opening up courts using technology. Matterhorn now offers solutions for family court matters, foreclosure cases, small claims mediation, criminal misdemeanors, and others. Well, I don't have enough time to explain precisely how Matterhorn works. I can tell you that it replicates what is critical while improving on processes wherever it can. It lowers costs and save time, saves time while focusing on the legitimacy of outcomes. Matterhorn is available at all hours of the day, is easy to use, and makes the process transparent. In most instances, people have the option to use Matterhorn, but are free to use more traditional procedures. The platform is extremely uh, configurable, so it uh, is easily adaptable to different workflows, and it can be deployed quickly by courts, agencies, or any entity that engages with citizens to solve outstanding problems or disputes. In the beginning, from the beginning, Matterhorn's outcomes have been really great across the board. In a nutshell, people find Matterhorn to be easy to use, act, easy to access, fair, and efficient. My own research shows that Matterhorn dramatically improves access, reducing default and small claims, reducing time to case closure, and increasing the likelihood of warrants being resolved. I don't have time to show you all of those um, facts, but I can um, uh, show you a few. For example, um, there are many people who indicate that they could not have gone to court absent Matterhorn. So these people just would have been out in the cold. Matterhorn results in pretty clearly um, uh, faster resolved cases. Litigants appear happy. There's better compliance with the ultimate conclusion of a proceeding. There are fewer defaults, uh, fewer disputes that follow from initial disputes, uh, positive spillovers to all sorts of areas. And in general, um, uh, we've been really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Now, two, 2020 has been a hard year, but one silver lining is that it has reinforced the idea that innovative courts are better prepared for the unexpected. Not surprisingly, interest in Matterhorn by courts across the nation have never been stronger, uh, has never been stronger. Courts are absolutely changing in dramatic ways, and I like to believe that Matterhorn has made that process at least a little bit easier than it otherwise would have been. With respect to safety, we know that Matterhorn has kept thousands out of courts and away from lines since the pandemic has begun. It has kept people safe, but just as important, it has kept the courts open during these crazy times and open for anyone, even those most at risk from COVID-19 along with those who face more traditional challenges. By reducing access barriers, Matterhorn has also aimed to reduce racial and other disparities uh, in our justice system. Better access to courts and the justice system disproportionately benefit those most disadvantaged, advantaged, who face the highest barriers, even in times without a global pandemic. And the shift to Matterhorn has also raised questions about disparities in outcomes, even among those who do manage to make it to court. There are good reasons to believe that online procedures have the potential to reduce implicit bias and other structural biases in our courts. Early empirical research shows reductions in racial disparities, for example, with respect to traffic fines, when parties use online hearings instead of traditional face-to-face -face hearings. I am way over time, and the panel was supposed to begin at 2.45. Perhaps I'll have a chance to say more during the panel. Let me just end by saying that a big part of Matterhorn's success has been the result of thinking very carefully about the institutions and the individuals who run our courts, working hard to anticipate the unexpected, being respectful of norms, people's time, and, and time-worn uh, practices, and always keeping in mind the need to bring data to bear as you evaluate and improve on your work. I wish I had more time to tell you about my research, uh, but it's discussion time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, JJ. That was a great presentation. And I'm sure your middle schooler is going to reward you this evening with a huge eye roll when she learns that you included her in your presentation. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Luke Schaefer, the Herman and Amelie Kahn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy and Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at U of M. Professor Schaefer is also the inaugural director of U of M's Poverty Solutions Program and the moderator of our panel. Welcome. Thanks, Kelly. I really appreciate that. It's uh, really terrific to be with you all here today to celebrate JJ as the Distinguished University Innovator of the Year. Uh, what an incredible and fitting honor for his work. Uh, to celebrate Matterhorn and all it's accomplished, and to celebrate his close uh, collaboration and partnership with the University of Michigan that helped uh, move this incredible story along from start to finish. Um, JJ, it kind of sounded like you had worked into your remarks that you had run over. So I, that's the only thing I had to question there at the end. Uh, um, as Director of Poverty Solutions, a university-wide initiative that seeks to move beyond basic research on the causes and consequences of part, uh, poverty and really um, partner with communities and policymakers to find concrete, tangible ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. I know uh, very deeply how important technology is for understanding the well-being of vulnerable families uh, for better and for worse. I'm very proud that Poverty Solutions partnered with JJ and uh, what was then Court Innovations, uh, Matterhorn on uh, early research on the impacts of, of the model and understanding the importance of fines and fees and in court systems and vulnerability and have enjoyed watching that grow to uh, Matterhorn having helped resolve uh, 110,000 cases. Wow. Uh, I've also done work around uh, a number of years ago, the unemployment insurance uh, fraud scandal here in the state of Michigan where a computer algorithm uh, falsely charged uh, tens of thousands of Michiganders with uh, fraud, uh, which is now, you can read all about it um, in the uh, free press and other sources. And so I understand the pitfalls as well as the opportunities, especially in today's era, right? Uh, during the COVID era, trying to understand how do we connect with people um, during a global pandemic and reduce some of these uh, inequalities in terms of access to courts and otherwise. So today we have a really exciting panel Access to Justice, Technology and the Democratization of American Courts, and an incredible set of panelists. So uh, Michigan Supreme Court Chief Justice Bridget McCormick is joining us. Professor Bernadette Atua-Hene, who is a professor of law at the Chicago Kent College of Law, and one of the uh, foremost experts on the crisis of tax foreclosure in the city of Detroit, uh, an issue that I've been following her work on for a long time. And Jason Tashia, who is a writer that explores the intersection of technology, policy, and law. I want to welcome our panelists, and I'm going to invite them in, in that order to offer a few opening remarks to talk about the role of technology in exacerbating or ameliorating social inequalities, democratizing the courts, uh, talk about your own work, and link it to what JJ is doing at Matterhorn. Justice McCormick, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Uh, thanks, Luke, and um, congratulations, JJ. This is a, a wonderful occasion. I'm, I'm so, um, so proud of you and Matterhorn and all that you have um, accomplished in what is in fact a very short time, um, in large part because I have such a personal um, understanding of uh, the problem uh, that I think your work and Matterhorn's work is um, aimed at solving. Um, so let me let me talk about that briefly. So um, as the Chief Justice of um, Michigan's Supreme Court, um, the state Supreme Court is charged with administrative oversight of the courts of the state. Michigan is a non-unified court system. We have 242 trial courts, over 500 judges, almost a thousand judicial officers when you count magistrates and referees and between three and four million cases are adjudicated in the trial courts every year. It's a, it's a stunning number of cases, right? I mean, I know we always talk about the, the federal courts uh, in law schools like the University of Michigan, but 
it's the state courts where most people have to um, get their business done, or as JJ well explained, uh, most people um, can't get their business done, or uh, can't afford to get their business done, or are too afraid to get their business done. Um, and it's a pretty enormous um, and entrenched problem to figure out how to address those many millions of people, most of whom can't afford lawyers. And let me just add that variable quickly. Um, eight out of 10 people in Michigan, like many other states in the country, can't afford lawyers when they have to resolve um, civil legal disputes. Obviously, in criminal cases, um, the court will provide you a lawyer if you can't afford one. But in many of um, the cases on our district court dockets, people either have to figure out how to navigate courts on their own or they just don't go. Um, and we know that in many, in many cases, they just don't go um, because of all of the barriers that JJ talked about. Um, so with all of that background, um, I'm so glad uh, JJ was willing to jump in and figure out whether his um, idea could, could work uh, because wow, it sure has. Um, in, in Michigan, a number of district courts started using it for um, traffic and um, warrants and had quickly uh, very, very high public satisfaction, as well as court administration satisfaction, by the way. The reduction in time that it uh, takes for court staff is significant. Um, but I want to talk about briefly about the um, very rapid expansion um, Matterhorn did this year for us um, when COVID hit with the platform where folks can resolve minor civil disputes. Um, and we are now offering that to everyone in the state. It's free, um, asynchronous, like JJ explained, and um, um, we're the first state in the country to do that. Um, the, the current pandemic has in some ways opened up all kinds of opportunities for us to respond to some of the most difficult parts of um, democratizing access to justice and technology is a big part of that. Um, but I will say that having Matterhorn there ready to do it um, just made all the difference in the world um, for us in, in, the, in the state courts of Michigan. Not, that's not to say that there's not a lot more to do there there is um, but it's been a tremendous partnership to be able to um, have Matterhorn to work with us and work incredibly quickly on standing up this platform for folks across the state I don't know if I'm over my my five minutes but but um, but I guess I can stop there because we're gonna have a fun discussion so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll pause I have lots of other thoughts but I'll pause for now and hear from my co-panelists I, I make it a point never to cut off Supreme Court justices, but uh, since you're at a stopping point there, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Professor Atua Haney. Wonderful. Uh, I am super happy to be here uh, to talk about JJ and his wonderful company, Matterhorn. Um, I met JJ and started working with Matterhorn in my work uh, here in Detroit around the property tax foreclosure crisis. So in Detroit, we have a situation where one in four properties has been subject to property tax foreclosure. One in four. We haven't seen this number of property tax foreclosures in American history since the Great Depression. So the question is, what in the world is going on in Detroit? Well, I conducted a study and Basically, the Michigan state constitution is quite clear. No property should be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. Uh, that constitutional provision is well backed up with legislation and case law. There's just no doubt. No property should be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. Other state constitutions and legislation, uh, to the extent they mention assessments at all, say things like they have to be fair, uniform, equal, all nebulous standards up to a judge to determine. Because Michigan gives a ratio, it means people like me can come in and run the numbers to determine legality, and that's exactly what we did. Our findings were astonishing. We found that between 2009 and 2015, in each of those seven years, anywhere between 55 and 85% of properties were being assessed in violation of the Michigan State Constitution. 
Then when we broke that data up into what we call five quintiles, quintile one being the lowest valued homes, quintile five being the highest valued homes, we found that in quintile one and two, meaning the lowest valued homes, 95% or more of homes were being uh, illegally assessed. But when we got to quintile five, only about 18% were being illegally assessed. And this has everything to do with people who are in more expensive homes, have more education, more money uh, to hire a lawyer to contest these assessments on their behalf. The final piece of this puzzle is that, uh, as many people know, 40% of Detroiters live below the poverty line. And in Michigan, if you live below the poverty line, you qualify for something called the poverty tax exemption. But because the city of Detroit had so many administrative hurdles in the way, people who deserved this exemption did not receive it. So we have a situation in Detroit where people were being illegally assessed in violation of the Michigan state constitution when they could not afford to pay these illegally the resulting illegally inflated property taxes. They were foreclosed on at rates we haven't since the, seen since the Great Depression, all for property taxes they weren't supposed to be paying in the first place. My God. So in comes Matterhorn. So one of the solutions is to make this poverty tax exemption more accessible. And at the moment you have to, I mean, all kinds of paperwork, repetitive paperwork is, is, is required. And so we began, we raised money from uh, Quicken, it's, it's problematic for other reasons, but whatever. Uh, we raised money for, from Quicken uh, to really think about involving Matterhorn to make these processes of applying for the poverty tax exemption uh, streamlined. And it's important to know that a lot of these administrative hurdles existed in Detroit because they did not have the manpower to handle the number of poverty tax exemptions that would have come flooding in without the, these administrative hurdles, right? So by streamlining this, it not only helps uh, end users, but it also helps the city of Detroit be able to increase the capacity to the level that it needs to be. So that's what we're currently working with Matterhorn is on this issue of the poverty tax exemption. As a next step, we hope to integrate this technology into the appeals process. Because again, one of the reasons behind the fact that lower valued homes, the majority of them are being assessed, over assessed, uh, but the higher valued homes are not is uh, because of um, you know, access to the appeal process. Um, and so that's the next step. And uh, again, Matterhorn's technology is not only for courts, right, meaning, you know, federal, state, or administrative, but it's been also useful in these administrative spaces. The last thing I want to say is, when you think about a company like Matterhorn and these online solutions, in a place like Detroit where we are experiencing a severe digital divide, right, how do you bridge that gap? Well, part of the ways that we're thinking about this is to make sure when this poverty tax exemption goes online, number one, to train librarians in how to guide people through this, because that's the, uh, one of the main places people go to uh, to ac access internet when they have no access to internet, and to also uh, equip various community organizations, allowing them to lead people through this online platform. And in this way, we have this digital solution, not um, disadvantaging or excluding or forgetting about certain populations. Um, and so it is really um, the promise and potential of Matterhorn, uh, in my experience, has been tremendous. And uh, I'm just uh, so glad to have uh, been working with JJ and MJ uh, on this very important topic of property tax foreclosure in Detroit. Thank you. Thank you. Jason? Thanks, look, and congrats, JJ. I, I can't imagine a, a more appropriate award for the last decade of work you've been doing. And I'm glad that the two speakers before me were able to talk about their successes with the platform. I was noticing during JJ's presentation that Maryland is still not highlighted as a state. And years ago, JJ brought me on to onboard the Maryland judiciary, which I apparently was not terribly successful at. So if anything, I'm evidence of all the work that is yet to come as the other two speakers are um, evidence of all the success that's already been. But uh, 
with that being said, I, I, the thing I want, I want to pull back a little bit in regards to the work that I did with JJ and Matterhorn and how it's kind of changed my view of what technology and access to justice looks like, which is where I spend most of my time thinking. And that's really this concept of what does it look like to build courts as a digital platform? I mean, courts have always been a platform in their nature. Um, they've just been analog. And I feel like, especially this year with COVID, that all of a sudden we have uh, a much more urgent need to think through this idea. And I think uh, Matterhorn has, has been doing this quietly and, and kind of covertly for years. Um, and now it's maybe time to push that conversation uh, to the fore on account of the successes that Matterhorn has had. Uh, just some of the numbers around the country, uh, San Diego County has 20,000 cases currently in their backlog. New York City has something like 40,000 plus criminal cases uh, waiting to be processed. Uh, the state of Connecticut has seen its case backlog go up 200% uh, during the period of the pandemic. Um, it's clear that there's a new added pressure put on courts in regards to uh, not only efficiency, but also access, right? In many states, courts are closed down. Uh, we're trying to do things like what we're doing now to being people into courtrooms or at least in front of judges, wherever they may be. Um, but the, the problem is, and as uh, Chief Justice McCormick pointed out, is that they were already in this process before the pandemic happened. So when the floodgates opened, they were able to just turn up the volume on the things that they were already doing to poorly mix metaphors. But the case is around most of the countries that this work wasn't being done. Um, whether states are unified or not unified, like in the case of Michigan, uh, forms will look different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Data collection will look different jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Most courts still haven't wrapped their mind around what it would look like to create an open API so that the data that they are creating is accessible to advocates like uh, Bernadette or uh, innovators like JJ that would need that data to be able to fuel a uh, platform, whether it's calendaring, uh, for cases, whether it's uh, mediation or ODR, like what JJ has done, or any other type of intervention that could happen. These are the types of infrastructure that is needed if the courts need to think of themselves outside of the brick and mortar platform that they've been for centuries. And so I feel like what JJ has been doing is basically offering the solution, but then through the offering that solution, these courts then have to think about, oh, well, we weren't doing all of these other foundational things that we need to do to make these types of projects successful, to be able to scale services, to be able to move services online. And so for that reason, thinking broadly, I think what Matterhorn has been able to do is expand the discussion where it's not just talking about a specific service like uh, what JJ has created, but rather taking that step back and thinking about the struggles that courts go through to be able to onboard a solution like that and build up that digital infrastructure, create those types of standards that are so common in other areas of our day-to-day -day life, like uh, banking, for example, medical is getting there as well. Law is certainly a laggard in this situation. And so not only do I think the, the celebration today needs to be about the 110,000 cases that Matterhorn has already closed, but the way that it's kind of expanded this discussion about what courts can be and how they can get there to do it. So um, that's what I'm excited to talk about today. JJ, we're going to give you a few minutes to uh, reflect on uh, the comments of the panelists, and then I'll start doing rapid fire questions. Great. Um, thank you, everybody. It's, it's so wonderful to have you here, and I really appreciate all the, the nice things you've said. Um, so I'll just start with uh, some of uh, Jason's points because I think they they link to um, all of the things that you guys talked about. Um, one of the biggest challenges in this space is um, basic infrastructure and data. Uh, I'm a, a, an applied empirical economist. A lot of what I love is data. And if you do work in the criminal justice system, well, actually, it's better than in a lot of places. Um, it's just not where it needs to be for us to go to the next um, level. And part of that is a function of how we organize our, our uh, country. I mean, we, we have federalism, so states do it differently. And even within states, courts and cities and everybody does it differently. And consequently, um, we're sort of spread out. And, um, and it's really costly to think about how do we, how do we um, build, build out of that situation um, both to have the kind of infrastructure Jason was um, describing, but also just generally to collect the data we need um, to, 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 to apply software uh, to problems in our, in our country. So, I mean, if there, if there isn't data, then you can't run, you know, you can't run something through 
um, uh, through a, a piece of software. And, and in courts that are, for example, still working with paper or are still recording things on, by hand, obviously it, the, the costs of moving in this direction are enormous. So I think that is a, a huge part of what needs to be done next. I'd like to think that Matterhorn and other things going on are showing us that this is possible and that now maybe because of the pandemic, um, some serious investments and in time will be spent thinking about at least at the state level, but maybe at the national level of how we can um, start building uh, a world where these kinds of tools will be easy to, um, uh, to apply. Um, I, you know, that, that, the, the comments also make me think about sort of what's next. So one of the, the focuses of, of Matterhorn to date has been, um, as Justice McCormick uh, pointed out, on, on, on people who have um, uh, and also Bernadette on, on, on issues that where people don't have representation. Typically minor issues um, and in more serious issues, the, 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 the work that is gonna have to be done to figure out how to apply technology to those is just, it's more, it's more difficult. But I do see um, a path in that direction. I mean, a lot of times the first reaction, indeed my first reaction to thinking about Matterhorn was um, this idea of, of having your day in court, this, 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 this notion that people have that some important part of justice is being in a room in front of people. And, um, and over time, I've come to believe that I'm not sure that that idea of justice works for everybody in our society and people are changing um, so that the ability to communicate now isn't necessarily um, at its best when you're uh, standing in front of 50 people or in, in front of a, a person who doesn't look like you, or uh, in a in a place that um, uh, you you know is is unfamiliar to you, uh, and um, so a lot of what we typically think about what's great about courts may only be great about courts for people who are privileged to have um, to have uh, been exposed to the to the to the right kinds of institutions and people and who are educated, and as we move forward into more and more technology um, in our everyday lives. I, I believe that a lot of people will come to value the ability to communicate, maybe not in total isolation, but the ability to communicate by text asynchronously, pulling in resources that they couldn't carry on them um, into a courtroom. And so court in the future may look very different, but exactly what it's gonna look like yet, I don't think we know. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and let other people jump in if they have um, ideas or questions. Well, JJ, you sort of picked up on something um... Justice McCormick had me thinking about. And so I'm going to invite the panel to uh, just start out uh, on this question and we'll move through a couple of different ones. Um, and uh, before I do that, I'll say, of course, one of the many things I like about JJ is he is both um, a lawyer and economist. And we heard a lot of social science uh, across uh, today's panelists, which uh, warms my heart. Um, one of the things that uh, we at Poverty Solutions just released a report on evictions in Michigan uh, pre-pandemic, and I've actually had the pleasure of working on the post-eviction uh, moratorium plan with Judge Boyd at the Supreme Court, as well as MISHTA and the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but one of the things that really struck me about our report uh, that we sponsored before COVID by Robert Goodspeed and others was that something like only 4% of those facing an eviction had legal representation. And so JJ, you know, as, as you all were speaking, as a non-lawyer, I was wondering, is, can technology play any sort of role here? Because we also know those who have legal representation in evictions uh, do much better. Their outcomes are a lot better. Is there, is there any role for technology in bridging that divide? Chief Justice? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and we're trying, you know, right now we're just basically doing everything with our hair on fire uh, because trying to uh, run a court system that's adjudicating 4 million cases a year, um, all of a sudden all online means you just have to try things and whatever, you know, works, you stick with it. And when it doesn't work, you tweak it. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. We've been allowed to act like entrepreneurs all of a sudden. Um, this year. Um, and as I, I know you're aware, Luke, we, we actually here in Michigan put the entire state into an eviction diversion program um, and uh, a little bit on faith be, uh, before, we, before the legislature had 
allocated CARES Act funding for it, but in fact, they came through with significant funding and um, part of our diversion program required um, folks to uh, proceed on the Zoom platform. Michigan courts, um, for whatever it's worth, have, are leading the nation in terms of doing more online. Um, uh, Jason, we, we have set ourselves apart from lots of other places. We have passed 1 million hours of Zoom hearings already. Um, in large part because we were a little bit better prepared. Everybody already had a Zoom license, not because we saw a pandemic coming, but because we did see some value in online platforms for lots of things courts do, and maybe because Matterhorn has been teaching us that. Um, but for whatever for, for whatever reason, we were a little bit better prepared when, when all of this hit. So it made sense to put our eviction diversion program as much as possible onto an online platform and um, not in busy, dense courtrooms that were not going to be safe for people. Uh, it's hard because, as you say, so many people have to proceed without lawyers. And even though our diversion program requires judges to tell them about legal aid and legal aid got lots of extra funding, um, it's messy and complicated. And um, lots of folks, when they don't even know that there might be an, a, a chance for uh, a counsel, just don't show up. Um, what we're already seeing sort of anecdotally, we don't have data on this yet, and I couldn't agree with uh, JJ Moore that like better data, better data, better data is, you know, has to be something we all have to keep striving for. It's just gonna help us do so many things, so many things better. But anecdotally, we're seeing that we're, we're getting a much better uh, response rate. More people are showing up for hearings, not just on the eviction dockets, but on lots of other dockets where they usually proceed without counsel when they can do it remotely. So I, you know, JJ's hunch is right. I mean, people for people are more comfortable um, showing up from their kitchen table or their smartphone when they're on a, a break from their job um, for lots of reasons. And I think one of the main reasons is because courtrooms are intimidating and all of that, you know, majesty that everyone's worried we're losing by doing things on a remote platform, my, my answer is usually, but were we nailing it before if 96% of um, people in eviction cases had to manage it without lawyers? And that means a lot of people just don't even try. They just move out when the eviction notice like shows up on their door, even if they have a legal defense. So we weren't, we weren't nailing it with the majesty um, in, the, in, the pre, in the previous world. So if we're seeing a lot better response rates, more people showing up, more people being able to articulate um, the facts that might in, might well lead to a legal defense, um, that's, you know, obviously better for access to justice, better for the rule of law um, across the board. Um, so I think there's a really important role for um, technology to play in all of these you know, dockets, eviction dockets, debt collection dockets, um, where people are trying to navigate courts on their own. Huge role, huge role for technology. I, the state courts are never going to look the same, if it, well, at least not in Michigan, if I have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. You can see the neutralization of a lot of different reasons somebody might not show up, whether or not they don't have the transportation, whether or not they're, they're nervous, they're able to sort of be in a in a safe place, um, and it sort of takes care of all of those uh, with um, with a set of resources. Professor Atuahene, do you want to speak? Maybe uh, you could also speak on the question of representation um, and how we, you know, I, I really liked your point about uh, taking advantage of libraries and uh, uh, community groups to help people move through the forms. Um, anything else that technology provides us in terms of um, access to a lawyer, access to um, uh, somebody who can help others, uh, an individual navigate a process like tax foreclosure, which was incredibly confusing, as you point out, was made confusing um, in a number of different ways. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a property scholar. So one of my main classes I, is I teach first year property. And when I was visiting at Fordham, I took my students on a field trip to housing court as part of the first year property class. And my goodness, uh, you know, it's forget about, you know, what, what, whether, you know, there's all these barriers that prevent people from arriving at court, which I think we've talked thoroughly about. But once you're there in the court, 
it is a complete, at least in New York, I don't know what's going on here in Michigan, uh, Judge McCormick, <laughs> but in New York, it was a complete and total zoo. Uh, you know, uh, you, the long lines, you don't know where exactly you're supposed to be. There's all the, the judges send you out of the room to do these side deals. It's going so quickly. People don't have access to information. I mean, you can go on and on. And um, I, I took my students on that field trip so they could see firsthand what it was like. And it was such an eye-opening uh, experience for them. And uh, the thing that technology does, again, it's not only preventing people who do shift, you know, people who do shift work can't give up a whole day to come, but it's also when you're there, it makes the whole process more accessible, right? By um, uh, doing, uh, you know, providing people information, you can give people as much, you know, uh, small bits of information as relevant as they go through the online process so they're not overwhelmed by information um through the online process not only can you serve people but you can educate people there are so many opportunities in terms of making the process more accessible uh for people who cannot afford lawyers and i think that's just so important mm -hmm. Jason and JJ, I want to turn to, we have a number of questions around data, and uh, you uh, both seem to, to love data. So JJ, tell me a little bit about, now that Matterhorn is up and running, we talked about the need to unify data sources from the courts and enable to, to do more of the work um, that we just heard about in terms of making things more accessible. There's, so there's something on the courts. Uh, we have a questioner wondering, can you use the data that you're collecting at Matterhorn to help improve processes, right? And understand more about where people are getting caught up? Absolutely. And if, um, if uh, you know, I had more time to get into my research, I'll, I, I've spent a, a fair amount of time trying to come up with pretty rigorous ways to test uh, the effect of online access, leaving aside whether it's Matterhorn or, or anything else, what, what are the consequences of having um, additional access in this way, facilitation of communication, um, uh, and uh, and the easy ability to, to to get things done outside of regular business hours, um, and and so you know I I can I can I'm happy to to share any of, of that work, but the, the by and large I mean things look good on both sides of the ledger from courts perspectives. Um, they I think a couple of things happen first. Um, Things are easier, takes a lot less time. There were lots of things that were done in a repetitive way that no longer need to be if you set up an online process uh, in, a, in a good way, which uh, turns out to be really important for the people who do a lot of the work at courts. Um, but on top of that, I think there is a lot of learning going on between courts. So, you know, as, uh, you know, as pe people at Matterhorn start to talk to a new court, that court may have been doing whatever it's been doing for many, many years. And, and this change gives them a chance to, to, to kind of figure out what other places are actually doing and to identify by going through their workflow. Like this is how we, have, we actually do it. To ask questions like, do we need to do it this way? Um, and, and that I think has led to some soul searching uh, on the part of at least some courts uh, and has, I think, um, um, I mean, there have been courts that have been more entrepreneurial in this way and, and others that have been less so, but many of them have decided, wow, like this, we were kind of excited about this in the beginning, but now we realize there's a lot more potential um, uh, to do this. It also helps us focus on what we think is really important. Um, one of the things I love about um, Matterhorn, at least from a research pers uh, researcher's perspective and starting to think about not so much online, um, uh, tools, uh, but more generally studying how we adjudicate and mediate cases to get to resolution mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. fact that an online environment is much easier to actually conduct research um, with, you know, from either a research perspective or from the court's perspective. I mean, if you, if you just take a, a, a very simple business um, concept of A-B testing, Courts can do that now in a way you just can't, you know, should we place a sign here? Is this sign gonna be easier for um, uh, people to see if we place it here in the court um, or over here? 
it seems very unlikely to me that there's a lot of experimentation going on like that in a traditional courthouse. However, when you have a dashboard and you know people are coming in and they're seeing something, you can, in theory, experiment all the time. Um, you can uh, change where things are located, change how you phrase things. There's been a lot of work in, in other domains where you, you know, just the change of tone can lead to, to um, uh, different behavior on the part of litigants. So this is something that hasn't happened. There hasn't been a, uh, very much of this research at all, at least, at least with Matterhorn. But I think it's, there's a ton of um, a potential upside to doing that, to working with courts to say, hey, you know, what do you think about instead of just proposing a payment plan, for example, let's spend some time thinking about um, maybe presenting options of a payment plan that look like this, or maybe we change how it uh, is framed in another way. And then let's see how well people do given that particular kind of framing. And you could go on and on and think about all of the things. A lot of it's related to compliance and also to, to the, the, the feelings that um, litigants, the citizens have after they leave. You know, do they feel like they actually understood what just happened? Do they feel like what happened was fair and legitimate? And in some of the work I've done, there's a very strong correlation between um, a sense of fairness, a procedural fairness, and ease of use. If people can ease, you know, I mean, of course, people, there's a strong association between how the case goes and their sense of fairness. So if they lose, that's obviously you know, not good for whether or not they think the, uh, the situation was fair. But if the process is really easy, people who lose will say that this process was a lot fairer than uh, a process that is more difficult. So I don't know if, that, if, that's, uh, if, if that's really um, responsive, but I hope, hope it, it gives you some uh, food for thought. Yeah, so uh, not just with the data that you would collect online versus uh, in person, but just a whole lot more opportunity to collect data about how things are working for people and to change practice as a result. Great. Jason, uh, do, would you weigh in on the question of using data with a platform like Matterhorn or otherwise um, to improve systems? Sure. And before I, I, I answer that, I want to jump on the uh, technology and access question, uh, where we hear that 96% of people going through eviction court don't have an attorney. Uh, we can't have that discussion about technology without talking about unlicensed practice of law regulations. We have a regulatory scheme in most states in this country that is protecting the 10% of people that can afford attorney while keeping the other 90% away from being able to access legal advice. And unless we're going to actually tackle the UPL issue and, and define it better, or, or in some cases, maybe consider getting rid of it or, or peeling it back, um, then I don't know if the technology is never going to be able to go as far as it wants. It, UPL creates a very specific ceiling over what technology will be able to do. And I feel like that has to be a part of that technology and access discussion. Um, as far as the, the use of technology or the use of data is concerned to improve these systems, I've spent most of my time working in the criminal justice system. Uh, and I would point attention to uh, programs like Measures for Justice and Recidivism, which is a bit newer. But the idea of these programs, they're both nonprofits and they acknowledge that there is a problem in the collection, standardization, and publishing of data in the criminal justice system around the country. So Measures for Justice, for example, goes county by county in choice states that they have picked to unearth that data with people on the ground to get the paper files out, to collect it, to organize it, to standardize it, and then ultimately publish it. And that's an amazing amount of effort that has to go into this. And, and JJ was talking a little bit about just the, the Yale man's work behind having to even make this data function. Um, and so I think that's really where we're at as, as far as usability is concerned. I still think we're in the foundational stages. I think that um, there was a, a Supreme Court case a couple of years ago. I, I think it was the, the redistricting case uh, out of North Carolina where Chief Justice uh, John Roberts started by basically calling all social science gobbledygook. Uh, which indicates that there is an education that needs to take place in the legal community about what data is, how do you use it, how do you use social science to complement uh, the things that we are traditionally taught in law school, like precedent and stare decisis. Um, and so I think that there are, are both foundational on the technical side and foundational on the user side, especially when it comes to, to lawyers and, and judges in regards to making this data actually impactful. Um, 
people like you, Luke, can write all of the reports you want, but if the readers um, that are making these decisions don't know how to interpret it, then there's still an extra bridge that we're going to need to go to, to, to truly make the impact, I think, that, the, that we want to be making in the, with the data uh, that like, platforms like Matterhorn are collecting. So Jason, are you advocating for a uh, social science module in law school? Oh yeah, D oh, data science, okay. uh, social science, without a doubt. I taught a law and technology course for the last three years and that was um, a big gap uh, for our students that we were surprised by. You heard it here first. Hey, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna respond to Jason's really important point about the uh, unlicensed practice of law. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, so Jason, that's, you know, right on, you hit that right on the head. Um, one of the ways in Detroit we're trying to get around that is through the Detroit Justice Center, which is one of the newest uh, legal nonprofits here in Detroit. Uh, we've created a community uh, legal worker program that is basically a paralegal program. That's another way to put it. Um, we call it community legal worker because of issues with the unlicensed practice of law. But it's so interesting because if you look at the medical profession, there are so many different consumer facing individuals. There's a, not only just the doctor, you got the phlebotomist, the physical therapist, the physician assistant, the nurse, I can go on and on and on. But in the law, we have one consumer facing entity, which is the lawyer which means the lawyer's doing a lot of work the lawyer should not be doing, right? That, um, and so one of the ways to really get at this is to take this issue of paralegals or community legal workers or what you, whatever you wanna call it more seriously. And that is one of the benefits of, um, of platforms like Matterhorn, like for instance, we, we're using this program to appeal property tax. We've created this program to appeal property taxes. And again, that's our next project, but Matterhorn is to try and get um, uh, an online system together. And that is great because it helps the paralegals help the people, right? Again, because online solutions by themselves when you're in, in, in context of a digital divide are, are not it. It has to be online solutions coupled with and that coupled with in Detroit is these paralegals or community legal workers. For those people who can't do it themselves, they act as the intermediary. Um, but again, what's so powerful is that the technology gives structure and makes the, the community legal worker feel more comfortable and able to engage these kind of complex processes. So, yeah. I'm jumping in too. Um, a, amen to all of that. I mean, um, there Arizona and Utah have uh, Supreme Courts have announced sort of regulatory sandboxes where they're exploring some of this. Um, and I don't know how 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 we aren't always talking about this as a piece of the answer to access to justice. As good as the technology might be, whether it's um, Matterhorn or even just the ability to do. Um, uh, hearings on the Zoom platform, if people can't find their way to it without the assistance of somebody, and that doesn't need to be a lawyer, um, there's a big gap. I just recently learned that, of course, in Ann Arbor, I love Ann Arbor, there's a, the magistrate in Ann, Ar Ann Arbor is working together with um, a police officer from the AAPD who goes um, every day to that park, JJ, where a lot of homeless people hang out in the middle of the day. I forget what it, you know which one it is, right downtown, as well as to the Delana Center. And folks who have warrants, he says, do you want to clear your warrant? We can do it with my phone right now. Um, and the magistrate's ready. And they literally are clearing warrants in the park and at the um, Delana Center um, right there on the platform. And then he's able to com communicate to people what they need to do next. If, if there is a next, sometimes you can just clear the warrant and get rid of it um, because they're never gonna be able to pay whatever the fine or the fee is and they can do it in immediate ability to pay determination. Um, but at the very least, you know, um, they're able to then have the clear instructions about, about what happens next. And in that case, it's, you know, a police officer basically acting as a paralegal. Um, and it's working, but that's because we don't have anyone but lawyers right now who can do that. Um, so, you know, kudos to the Ann Arbor Police Department for getting innovative and the magistrate for working with them. But we have to be talking about other professionals who can help people get to these mm -hmm. solutions. 
I have to say, um, you know, I, I love that we all picked up on this question. And this is uh, one that I've been super interested in across a range of professions. In fact, I've been a long term advocate of a mid level dental provider. As Bernadette mentioned, uh, in physical health, there are a lot of different providers. Um, in oral health, there are fewer. And Michigan is actually uh, one of the very first states to have a mid level provider that can do restorative care. Um, but I will just mention that uh, while many of my uh, best friends are dentists. Uh, also, my first hate mail came from dentists uh, as a result of that interest. And I wonder, um, we got to be brief here, but uh, is there, uh, do you expect um, any pushback on the idea of trying to open up who can provide some of these types of legal services? Um, yeah, I mean, so Washington State was the first state to allow for a uh, limited, um, what would be the way to put it, basically a limited uh, paralegal type individual like this and their Supreme Court just recently got rid of that program. Hmm. Um, so clearly uh, there's push there. I was doing some reading the other day about uh, the growth of unified court systems within the United States, which is a discussion that started about 1906 hmm. uh, and it took 30 years for the American Bar Association to endorse the idea of unified court systems. Um, and it feels like to me uh, living in this moment that the UPL is much more of a third rail uh, regulatory issue than unified court systems mm -hmm. uh, ever were. So I would expect this to be a long, long fight. Long process. So uh, I'm going to cap that part of the discussion, but would love to follow up with uh, any of the panelists uh, for a longer term one in the future. I want to ask JJ, we have a couple of questions that have come in that are pretty specific to Matterhorn. So I'm just going to rapid fire ask them of you. And I'm going to ask you to um, be concise in your answers which since you just won a major award, I can say it's not usually within your nature, but uh, if you'll just go with us this time. And then I'm gonna ask all the panelists to build on this incredible foundation, like this um, innovation uh, sort of way forward uh, that Matterhorn has shown us. What do you wanna see happen next, either with Matterhorn and uh, the courts in Michigan or just nationally, how we can use models. If, if you could see one next thing that would become um, sort of the next direction for this work, what would be? But first, JJ, uh, we have a question. Immigrant courts have been using digital technology mostly as a means to cut costs for more than a decade now. And there's a widespread belief that the system is actually hurting immigrants. Can you talk about your view on how to ensure that introducing novel digital technology in the court system serves the needs of people? Uh, and not make them worse off. I guess that I'll let you be a little longer on that answer. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, the truth is, um, I think there are uh, pressures pushing in both directions. Like, you know, in a world in which um, uh, uh, judges or other actors in the system are, are used to meeting people in person and are maybe drawing inferences from situations where they're not able to do that, it's not surprising to me that there are disparities. On the other hand, um, with a lot of these remote types of uh, solutions, uh, there are disparities cutting the other direction. And so one of the slides I showed very quickly when I went through um, some of my research suggests that uh, you, you know, moving to asynchronous text-based types of interactions mm -hmm. actually may improve communication mm -hmm. and has a chance of, of mm -hmm. disrupting uh, structural biases in how we do uh, a uh, certain processes right now. So for some reason, I mean, I can come up with lots of good reasons. I, I never even thought about this before. The way we take evidence is by having somebody come to a place and speak about it um, as, a, as a witness testifying. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, I don't think it's surprising to, to, to think that maybe not all groups are equally capable of doing that effectively. And so having just one way of doing it um, strikes me as um, uh, uh, potentially problematic. Now, it could be that any particular technology will create disparities. I think we need to take the data to it and test it. JJ, does Matterhorn make it easier for litigators, e.g. landlords, to file litigation? And if so, how do you prevent it from being abused? Yeah, I, I mean, I, in general, I would say that technology is already um, out there. So the, the ability to e-file is something the courts have been moving to mm -hmm. for a long time. And I think um, the question is whether or not the ability for defendants or plaintiffs and small claims to, um, uh, to get onto the same playing field is the question we want to, um, as we, we want to ask. So um, already it's possible uh, for maybe um, uh, for uh, heavy 
heavy hitters to file a bunch of lawsuits at the same time. And one of the reasons they do that is because it takes so much effort for an individual to respond to that. So part of what we need to do is make sure the technology is leveling the playing field and not giving systematic advantages to one side over the other. JJ, we've got a, um, uh, a viewer who's thinking big and wants to know, could this technology be used in court systems outside of the United States? Of course. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing US specific um, about this way of communicating. Um, it, it, you know, depending on where we're talking about, one of the challenges is going to be systems and data. And uh, wherever you have uh, enough infrastructure to move in that direction, it, it, it would be um, uh, well worth trying. And there have been experiments going on in, in um, higher income countries like this and even in some middle income countries. So maybe even easier in some cases with more integrated data systems uh, and not quite so much federalism. That's right. And also, um, you know, a leapfrogging of technology where everybody mm -hmm. uses um, cell phones and is, is quite comfortable um, uh, making important decisions, moving around money, using a cell phone, paying for things with a cell phone. The idea of going to court on a cell phone might seem more comfortable. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with Chief Justice McCormick and just ask uh, if we come back in a year and JJ has won another award um, <laughs> or... Uh, Bernadette has won an award uh, for pushing forward this work. What do you think are the directions you'd like to see, right? What are the opportunities or the next thing um, that you want to accomplish using technology to democratize the courts? Yeah, I mean, I think the next thing is what we're, what's happening right now. You know, we are in, in the middle of more change in our um, state court systems than we've seen in many decades, just in the last six months. And I, the, the really important question that we have to um, answer, and maybe JJ and MJ and other folks are, will, will have it for us, is what, what, when the virus is gone, what do, what do we look like? What, what, what of the things we've been doing do we keep? You know, which um, do we improve on? You know, which were a good start that li like lead us in you know a a, a direction to improve on? Ha what have we learned about um, which things it makes sense to reserve um, actual in court time for? You know, we have some gut feelings about that, but I don't think we have all the answers to that quite yet. Um, and you know, where where are where, where's the next? Um, level of everything we're doing, you know, what, what, making sure we don't go back just because we can, if it's safe in nine months or whatever that uh, amount of time is, feels really, really important to me. And the, the you know, our profession um, has resisted the tech uh, revolution really well for a really long time, right? You know, maybe maybe only education is tied with us for how successfully we've be, been able to like avoid democratizing what we do. Um, and so we have this once in my lifetime opportunity right now because everybody who resisted, you know, I told you we got these Zoom licenses for all the judges in Michigan. I think they, you know, literally like said, well, I don't know, thanks for that. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. Nobody used them, right? Nobody used them until March 20, whatever, right? And then all of a sudden everybody had to use them. Everybody had to figure this out. And my big concern is um, when it's safe to go back, how many people will want to go back? And, and those people are lawyers and judges. They're not the vast uh, majority of the public who have to figure out how to resolve disputes. And often for them, it doesn't make sense to come to a courthouse to do it um, for all the reasons JJ said, and maybe lots of other ones. I, let me give you one other example of something that maybe should have been predictable, but wasn't. We've heard over and over again from judges in cases where there are kids, so child protection cases, um, custody cases where there are, um, uh, th that are contested, how much more comfortable kids are on a remote platform, right? Courtrooms are scary, they're intimidating. So judges will say, I've had this kid on my docket for two years, she's never said anything. All of a sudden now, she wants to show me her room. She wants to show me her homework, you know, because talking into a phone is perfectly comfortable for, for kids, right? Unlike courtrooms. So figuring out how to make sure we don't go back on the things that clearly are better for the public that we're doing now, and then improving on those um, 
is what I what I stay up at night worrying about and want JJ to figure out and win another award for next year. Or Bernadette. Professor Atua Haney. Listen, these technologies uh, like Matterhorn are awesome and they have a great potential to even the playing field. Hmm. Only if we take the digital divide seriously. Because if we don't take the digital divide seriously, these technologies can actually reinscribe the disadvantages they were meant to erase. So the real question on the table is how do we then take this digital divide seriously? And I think that it is really by focusing on intermediaries. And I've named two intermediaries um, during the course of our conversation. Number one being these community legal workers there is an international movement led by a nonprofit called Namati of increasing the presence of paralegals um, as, a, as, a, um, as a primary mode of, of giving access to justice, not just in America. I mean, this is a problem everywhere in Sierra Leone. 95% uh, uh, of all qualified lawyers live in the, in, in the capital city. And so when you're talking about the rest of the population, they go without justice services. And so we do need these community legal workers to step in. And so if we take the digital divide seriously, we need intermediaries like these community legal workers, number one. And a second kind of intermediary, which I've also mentioned, is taking existing institutions like libraries, where meeting people where, they at, where they're at. Where do people that don't have internet already go? In the context of Detroit, the answer is libraries. And in different other places, the answer may be different. But really seeking out the, to really, and, and it's not just saying, oh, they go to libraries. Well, then it's about empowering librarians to guide people through. If they're coming there for that service, we need then the librarian to become the intermediary to help them through, to guide them through these online processes. So my uh, final thought in terms of the way forward to make sure again that this amazing technology does what it's supposed to do in, te in terms of democratizing courts democratizing justice right we have got to take digital divides seriously and and we do this by think being very intentional about intermediaries thank you jason yeah, I agree with uh, everything that's been said here. I think we need to continue to move forward with, you know, a silver lining to what has been an otherwise very difficult year uh, for us in the world. Um, but also we need to be auditing these changes that we're making just because we're adding technology doesn't necessarily mean uh, we're doing the right thing. Uh, where I have concerns are around uh, privacy implications, putting trials online, like how this panel is online right now, uh, opens a whole wealth of privacy issues that current, previously didn't exist because there was a functional obscurity. You'd have to go to court to be able to hear someone that's pleading, say, whether or not they have a mental health issue. And when the majority of people in the criminal justice system have a mental health issue, you're now putting those things on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I think these are, you know, specific concerns we have to take seriously, especially after we see the exploitation that happened around mugshots over the last couple of decades. Um, the other thing, I, I can't agree enough about the digital divide point, but the other thing that I think we need to make sure, and this comes from my background in, in the criminal justice system, is there, there's a genuine possibility that this adoption of technology during the COVID era is creating a massive access to counsel issue. Uh, if we look back even pre-COVID, the Cook County used to have a, uh, a video bail uh, system, and it essentially got shut down because uh, well, they were sued by the public defender system, essentially because the system was set up in a way that kept attorneys from talking to their clients at the period of bail, basically the decision of whether or not someone is going to be incarcerated as they await uh, whether or not uh, a jury finds them guilty or not. Um, and that existed before COVID. And now we're trying to do all these things rapidly. And so I can only imagine that it's going to exacerbate these types of problems um, as uh, we've been trying to do these things uh, very quickly just to keep the gears of justice moving in some form. So I think we just need to be vigorous. We need to continue expanding what works, but we also need to be rooting out what doesn't. Okay, so harnessing the innovation that was born out of crisis and making sure we don't just go back to the way things were. Um, bridging the digital divide and make sure we're not exacerbating inequalities, but rather helping to um, reduce them. 
uh, figuring out issues of privacy, right, and understanding what means being online uh, to protecting people, and working out these access to counsel issues, uh, which are uh, underpinning the uh, community legal worker model, as well as some of our scope of practice questions today. So just a few things that you've laid out, and uh, we're at the end of our time, so I guess I'm going to invite JJ to uh, have the last word. I, I, I want to keep it short. I just want to thank everybody for coming and taking the time to talk about these issues. Um, it is a, a time of great disruption. Um, and uh, I, like, I like the fact that out of all of this may come some silver linings um, for our uh, justice system. And um, I hope that everybody on, on, uh, on this panel and everybody who's listening in uh, can keep thinking about these problems. And uh, let's hopefully we can, uh, in, maybe not next year, but in, in, in 10 years, we can reconvene right. and the system will look very different. 10 years, that's too long. We're expecting okay, your next years. award in three years. Yeah, you have three years. So um, <laughs> with that, let me thank uh, just a really fantastic panel for your insights across so many domains and um, for the exchange of ideas. And thank you, JJ, for inviting all of us and bringing us together for this. And many congratulations on, on the well-deserved award.